Hey everyone, um, it's Istavak and um, today's video is going to be about light sources and how to do lighting. Um, of course I'm not going to, it has to be, there's a lot behind lighting that has to be explained first. Um, some basic rules, some basic um, stuff that can't be ignored, the real physics behind it. And um, the, like I always say, the study of art is the study of form and form is visible only when light is present in the room. If the light was off, you would see nothing, therefore there would be no form revealed. How is form revealed? What is form, Mr. Breck? Form is the 3D mass of an object, the three-dimensionality of an object. Um, it is revealed when there is light because there are aspects of that three-dimensional object that look away from the light, that are not directed towards the light. So let me explain what I'm talking about. Okay. So we have light source, we have the room right here, and then we have the three-dimensional object, which is the circle. Well, retarded circle, okay. All right, we have this, th this light shining on it. So what I mean by three-dimensionality, or dimensionality, or I don't know what the word is, um, I mean there are two dimensions. There is X and Y, which is width and height or length, and then, I mean, well, yeah, you can say that. And then there's the breadth, the deepness, the the volume, the cup that isn't just squared. It's the, 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 the part of the cup that can be filled because of the three-dimensional aspect of the form. So this is the z-axis. So this object here doesn't only have a width x and y, width x and y, but it has the z-axis as well, meaning that it has fat. It's filled. It's a, it's a real live circle. It, imagine this was 3D. Imagine it could roll and bounce. And what is the other one? Cast a shadow. Um, this casting of the shadow is what reveals to me that there is form, is what there is the proof behind the form. So this shadow here is looking away from it, looking away from the light. And the light can only reflect back at or reflect back at the surface areas that are facing the light. So this is what I mean by form. This is the definition of form. Now let's think about the fundamental rules. First rule is that light, there are many parts or aspects of light and light sources and shading and working with light sources that need to be remembered that happen. So first and foremost thing is the direction. Let me help this. The direction means that the circle we looked at, there is a part of the circle that's looking away and part of the circle that's looking at the light source. Okay, this three-dimensional circle. Sphere, sorry. Okay. The next thing is the intensity of the light. Okay, so it means how bright this is. Direction has to do with this in relation to this. Intensity has everything to do with this. All right. Oh, whoops. Two ones. Three is the material. Material of the object. So this goes back to this. This is about this and this is about the both of them. This material, this is the difference between the surface of an apple and the surface of steel. So it can be a really shiny surface. A shiny surface changes how this object reacts to the light. It can be more reflective, so material can be reflective. Reflective, which means, or matte, which means not reflective. There's no um, shiny component, shininess component to the material of the object that has the form that you are drawing. For instance, you are drawing a cape, a red cape. What is that cape made of and how is it going to reflect the light back? So we have direction. Sorry about my crappy writing. We have intensity. We have material. And lastly, we have the color. The color of the object as well as the color of the light. Okay. Now looking back at this Everything changes about how this works when you involve all of these components. 
the direction, for instance, it might not be the um, a circle, it might be a square. And so everything changes after that. Now we have edges. And the reason why I don't include the shape of an object in this list, you might be questioning why I haven't included the shape, because the sh these rules are consistent no matter what the shape is. The, the, the rules don't change because you're painting a square. The rules don't change because you're painting a triangle or something. These are really consistent rules in the way light behaves with material. Light behaves with matter. So when we're talking about this object, these rules are exactly the same. The square is going to react the same way that the circle will. However, it, the, the only difference is, of course, the edges. Sometimes there are edges, sometimes there are no edges. So the only issue here, the only difference, the only real um, thing that you need to remember between shapes and the way they react to light is graduation, like gradual tone versus cut, sudden cuts. So sudden dark corner, sudden turn. So this is all light and then a sudden dark corner and this all becomes dark. That's really the only difference. And this is really essential when you're painting buildings so you understand how to paint them. When you're painting different weapons, when you're f painting different kinds of faces. Um, is there a gradual tone or is there going to be a sudden edge? So depending on the st skeletal structure of a face, it could be a very masculine face with a really pronounced um, bone structure. What you're used to, maybe you're used to painting girls all the time, and you're used to the gradual tone, the soft cheek, the soft uh, brow bone, you forget to include that harsh edge sometimes that happens in male faces when the light is being cast from the side. So these are all really, really important things to remember because they're consistent everywhere you paint. Um, it, you may be thinking, well, faces are harder because you have to think about skin tones. Skin tones is for another day. Even if you're painting in grayscale, these rules of lighting are really important. So when we're when we think about intensity, intensity is a really big part of this material. Okay, we get it. Material it can be matte or reflective, and that's pretty much it. You can look up tutorials, you can look up a reference, and see how reflective mat matter acts when it's um, exposed to light. Matte doesn't really react that much, so there isn't much reflection, there isn't much glitter, let's call it, or gloss. Um, matte is very, uh, uh, very basic gradual tones that happen in, in matte, usually base tone and shadow tone, never a highlight tone with this, but this is a definite highlight tone. You definitely, if, if you're painting metal or metal or some kind of metallic mech or something, you're going to need, forgetting about color for a second, you're going to need the mid-tone, you're going to need the shadow tone, which isn't really, there isn't really a shadow, it's more it's like reflecting the colors around it, but there is something of a, of a, of a dark tone in there, and the really, really high light tone. It's not going to be like a sudden um, a sudden drop. Uh, I mean it's always going to be um, really big distances between the main components of the grayscale. What, basically what I mean is look at this map, look at where this dark is, where this mid ground is, and where this there's or where the light source is. There's massive difference in metallic surfaces versus matte, dif matte surfaces which don't have that big a variation. So you have the mat, the, the mat. you might have a slight, depending on suede or something, a high light tone, maybe a tiny bit lighter, and the dark tone. The distance between these is not that high, there's no contrast. There's a contrast difference with material. Okay, so let, that's material, it's pretty straightforward. All right, there's a contrast difference in material. Okay, and again, it all depends on intensity as well. It always leads back to t intensity. Intensity covers all of these factors. Um, direction, I already explained it. It's just simply surface area. Surface area, what does that mean? It means the flattest part that's facing it directly. So let's think about it as a, um, let me enlarge this so I don't have to keep using a new layer so you can see the notes. <clears throat> so surface area has everything to do with direction. So surface area. What does surface area mean? It is light source. The cube is facing the light source. All right, this surface area, meaning this, barely self-explanatory, this area here, this very flat 
area and what it's pointing to. And it all boils down to this, ladies and gentlemen. Light is composed of arrows, vector type rays of light. There, don't think of it, did I just say der? Don't think of it as, um, as one big glowy globe of glowing magic. It is a bunch of arrows. Once you think of it like that, understanding casts shadows, which is a big part of light source. Um, let me just add that in. When you think about it as arrows, understanding surface area and direction is going to be really easy. Want to know why? Because arrows don't just sit there when they reach the top of the... Um, when they reach the surface of the object you're painting. They don't just sit there. What do they do? They bounce back. And that's where all of that stuff about how black clothes get really dark in, in the summer and white clothes stay pretty cool because white holds no color and black holds all the colors of the light rays because light is divided into multiple colors, the Roy G. Biv, the rainbow. And it hogs all the colors, therefore the heat intensity is confined in the black color. You'd think that colors wouldn't have this intense magical component to them, but they do. Colors react differently to light. Red is another one of those really, really hot colors. Um, you might have studied this in school. Yellow, really light, not much color into it. The only color that gets reflected back is the yellow, or gets kept is the yellow, and all the others, other, other colors get reflected back. That's why it stays yellow. That's how our eyes work. So the surface area here, if it was a white color, which, we, which we'll talk about later, which I just touched on that a little bit, um, it'll just bounce back beautifully, and it'll, the light will bounce back. However, this white surface that has beautifully bounced back all the color and has remained white of this, of this cube has a shadowed area. Is this sh shadowed area going to stay the same intensity? Absolutely not, because direction, the rule of direction tells us that the light has to be reflected back directly at the light source again. Not directly at the light source, but everywhere else in, in, in a way where it stays exposed to the light. So it really is reflecting back at the light. These two arrows, this two grouping of arrows is corresponding with each other, reflecting back at each other. Therefore, we know that this area is exposed and this area is the lightest of the object. It is facing the light source. Whatever faces the light source gets the light. Really straightforward. However, depending on the color of the object, it will have a shadowed area no matter what. Everything has a shadow. Everything casts a shadow. This is a rule. No matter how, what color it is, what kind of material it is, unless it's invisible, it'll cast a shadow. Unless it has zero form, it'll cast a shadow. Okay? Everything that has form casts a shadow. Okay? So this is all pretty straightforward. I mean, how difficult can lighting be? How difficult can lighting be in bringing it into your illustrations as a, as a, as a digital artist or whatever? If it can be summed up into four major, major categories. Um, it's really not that difficult, guys. As long as you keep this, you know, this whole sh spreadsheet here just beside you on the screen, whenever you're drawing or sketching, just think of this stuff and it will absolutely change your image. The image would have been different from what it would have been if you hadn't used these reminding reminding points, these rules, these points, okay? So we've taken care of direction. Direction is basically which part of the object is facing the light and which part of the object isn't facing the light. The part that isn't facing the light gets a shadow. Depending on the color of the object, the intensity of the shadow might be exaggerated or decreased. If it's a big rock and if the light isn't that intense, then it might be a pretty, not that light area here. It might be just a really gray tone and the dark tone there. The dark tone might sometimes be darker and it might be gray. For instance, in night scenes, there's not much variation between the dark and light points in night scenes because there's not much light to begin with. The light isn't revealing that much. Low light means low um, contrast. So there's another rule to remember. Low light equals low contrast, <clears throat> which leads us back to what? Intensity. Intensity has everything to do with this because intensity pertains to the nature of the light source we're looking at and we're using. If the nature of the light source is 
the high, the contrast is up, therefore everything else acts differently. The color will act differently, the material will act differently, and the direction, though it is the nature of the object, so this is the nature of the light, nature of the light, and the direction is the nature of the object. So these two are set in stone pretty much, but the material and color acts really differently when it comes to intensity. But the direction also can be um, med meddled with if the intensity is really high. Because if you're talking about a ball in a big white room and the intensity is really light and the apple is just sitting there, it's a white golf ball or something, it will almost cast zero shadow. The direction doesn't, won't matter because there's light coming in from everywhere. Remember, light is intense. I mean, light is, <laughs> sorry, light is... Um, is uh, arrows. And so if you're in a room, this is all white. Imagine it to be a white room. And the light is shining, let's say, from up here. It's really, really massive light. Okay, so think of it as an arrow that's being thrown out of a bow. Okay, if it's thrown out really intensely, it will have a high projection. The, the speed and velocity will be very, very high. And so it will continue to bounce and bounce and bounce. It'll take a while before it slows down and stops bouncing and finally just disintegrates or, or lands somewhere and stays somewhere and that area gets hotter and hotter. What usually happens with, with room lighting is usually it's not that intense. Large cast shadows will happen with lamps or... It's a retarded lamp. Okay, with lamps they will cast a shadow as well. A table will cast a shadow but I'm talking about the intense light that casts so much light that this shadow almost disappears and it becomes really, really, really faint. And this object here is really, really, really light because instead of the object stopping the light, stopping the direction of the light in its tracks and saying, no, you shall not pass, go around please, you will not attack my dark side, it goes around the dark side because there's light reflecting all around everywhere. So this whole area will be lit. That's intensity. That's high, high intensity. And it's very rare you're going to have to paint something this high because you most of the time you're just going to have to be in a white canvas and barely any form is visible. We always want the sweet spot, the spot in between, really dark and really light. And you always manage that spot if you paint in grayscale and the midtone. This midtone color here that I've chosen for the background so you can't even see it because I chose it for the background. Um, this midtone is what you need, the one I've chosen already, because it's that beautiful soft spot. The light won't be that light. Remember, I tell you, keep away from this intense area. This should be your highlighter for the grayscale that you're working with, and this should be your dark tone. Now, this is very, really sort of like a high contrast area, but, it, but you should have a gradual movement between every one of these values. So it should slowly move through. Only small areas of the canvas should be this light. Okay? Okay. So we've checked out intensity. Intensity is the intensity of the light, the amount of rays coming out, and how powerful and thick those rays are, and how bouncy they are, and how much of the shadow they're letting exist on the object. The direction is the nature of the object. The object that is revealing itself to the light, saying, hey light, I'm a 3D object, come cast some shadows on me so I can reveal my form. And so if the light was coming from here, on this object here, the shadow will cast over here, the light will cast over here. However, there's another big, very big component of light source that has everything to do with direction, intensity, and the arrows. It is the cast shadow, this thing that I talked about earlier, this long shadow. This shadow decreases according to the intensity. Remember I told you if it's intense, the light will wrap around the object, not allowing it really to even have a cast shadow or even have a shadowed area. This cast shadow is really massive and it's a big rule of light. I mean, it's consistent even in space. When you have like a, um, an eclipse, that's just the shadow of the moon on top of the Earth. These th rules are consistent no matter what the size is. So remember, these rules are really important. It, they're, they're, they're universal rules of physics. This is how th this is the nature of the physical world in which we live, and it's good for you to understand them as an artist. So this cast shadow, depending on the intensity of the light, will cast from, will extend from the darkest area of the, of the light source. You're never going to see a cast shadow extend from this area because this whole area is lit with light. It's what what what. It's not a good living condition for a shadow. It's not a, it's not the habitat of a shadow of a light source. I mean. 
This, however, is the habitat of a shadow. If there was dust in the air, if there was dust flying all the way in the air everywhere, you would see that the shadow isn't just on the ground. The ground is an illusion of where the shadow really is. The shadow is over here. And you see this kind of shadow when the light, when there's a lot of particles in the air, or the air is really moist and there are clouds, and the clouds are in front of the sun. Maybe it's just after it rained or something and the air is really moist and there's a lot of humidity. What happens is the particles in the air also get lit up and there are shadowed areas that also um, get whatever, they get lit up. So really what we're talking about, not lit up, but they're a reaction of the lit up areas. So the, what we're talking about is this area here gets lit up. So it's again, this is also an illusion. And this area here is all lit up with particles. And the particles are catching the light. So imagine that you're in a really dusty room and you move around the curtain and the light comes through and it's a sunny day. You see those lights, right? You see those pretty rays? Those are not the shadows you're looking at. Those are the lit up particles. The shadows are a byproduct. Just like the, sh the cast shadow is a byproduct of the umbra, I think it's called, the penumbra of the, um, of the object that's standing in front of the light. Okay, I think it's umbra. The penumbra is the second shadow in between the sun and the moon. I don't know. But yes, all right? So it's a really, it's a big chain of cause and effect light source. And it can be very confusing because it's, it's hard to just come up with one rule. You as an artist, you don't like to, you know, you just want to draw and enjoy what you're doing. And you want someone to say it's nice looking. Um, that's it at the end of the day. God damn it. <laughs> that's really all we want from the world. So you don't want to be worried about all these, all these, you know, units of, of measurement and all of this, this stuff. So, but you, as the artist, are studying physics. And physics, no one said physics was easy. No one's ever going to say physics is easy because there's too much going on. Um, and there's so much to observe. But for the sake of art, um, this is all physics really does in art um, it, when it comes to light and color. Um, in that one book, uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, it's really famous. Everyone reads it, the art book. Um, uh, Alla Prima. Yeah, Alla Prima. He talks about the way light, the way he sees the, an, a painting. He says the painting isn't just a bunch of edge, like it isn't, for me, it isn't, I think this is what he's saying, pretty much, I'm trying to like sum it up. It's just a bunch of light. That's what he says. That's really what he's saying in that, in that paragraph. He's, he's, he explains that it's just a bunch of light and the way light acts in all its versions, all the versions of itself, all the ways it can, all its forms, light as color, light as a shadow, light as light reflected back, light as the light source, light as the light reflected off a wall. Everything is just color happening in front of you. I mean light happening in front of you because as soon as you close the curtain and turn off the light, none of it is visible and if it's nighttime outside, none of this is visible. So really you're painting light. And that's amazing to me. That really just summed it up for me when I read it because if you think of it like that, you think of the origin of art, the real origin of what it is that we're studying, it's form. And form as revealed by light. Light governs everything. And I think it's like freaking miraculous or amazing or some sort of genius must have been behind the writing of the Quran and the book, I mean the Bible and all the other books because at the very beginning it says let there be light. And that's when everything existed because before that what, what was visible? And our eyes are the objects, are the are the tools of of observing the miracle of light. So what happens when it's a miracle, but the phenomenon of light? Okay. So that's pretty much it for this. Um, there are there's a lot of detail to go into. There's a lot of there's a lot of stuff to go into um, regarding color and material and intensity and direction. A lot more. To about how light reacts um, through air and atmospheric fade in a landscape. Just realize, imagine I'm holding your face. <laughs> Remember, it's okay not to know everything. It's not okay, however, to stop trying to know. It's not okay to learn a couple of rules and stick to it. You're, it's not okay for you to think you're, you're going to stop learning at some point. You will always continue learning. There is always something else to learn, either it's in the um, expressive area of, of what, what art is, or the physical area of what art is, or the observable uh, physics and art. Um, if I mean, there's always something to learn. So don't be overwhelmed. 
don't don't say this is so much shit. I, what the fuck am I gonna do? This is I don't know how I'm gonna go around this. You what you need to do now as the artist is take in what you can. Write down these notes. I'm gonna have them written neatly <laughs> under in the description area so you can copy paste them to your next painting. Think about them not necessarily in this order, but try to try to approach it in this order because we're thinking grayscale right now. So grayscale, you can still draw the direction in grayscale. You can still determine the intensity of, a, of it in grayscale. Material can still be determined in grayscale. However, when you add color, that's when things change. Um, and one last little thought on color, by the way. Color, when you bring in a, a, an object that is colored, let me show you what happens when we get a red like this and desaturate it. It goes a lot darker. There's a darkness that is added to it when you remove the color. Color has... Okay, so let's grayscale it now. Let's find its grayscale version. It is a lot less bright, I believe. A lot less bright. This is a... this. Let's see this as a graph. The brightness... This is the brightness... This is the y-axis of light and the color. This is where it was when it was grayscale. Look at this. And when we think about this color, look at how high it climbed till it got to this color here. Now this is no man's land, or near no man's land. You want to need this until you're like in the in the hottest part of a fire, or not even the hottest part, the hottest part is like almost orange or something. Or like a super bright, intentionally super, super bright, glowy monster knife or sword of some crazy champion from League of Legends or something. You don't need this kind of bright anyways, but look at the brightness difference. Look at how the brightness changes when you add color. So thinking about this red, this red, this red, you have to imagine it to be, um, you're always going to have to change something. Um, and grayscale, gray, working in grayscale isn't, this, isn't a way to, to learn how to paint in color. You learn how to paint in color when you paint in color. Learning to paint in grayscale teaches you about intensity and the direction and material allows you to take on all of that without having to worry about color just yet. So paint in grayscale, guys. It's really important. Um, uh, it'll, it'll break down your learning process and like I always say, breaking down the learning process is what helps you learn faster and more efficiently. You're, su you're going to suck in more information because all at once it's too much. Just like what I taught you today. All at once it's a lot to take in. But bit by bit, thinking about what direction is, and thinking about uh, what intensity is, what I, how I explained it, material and the kinds of material you're going to be drawing, and the color, all at the same time is not going to work. Slowly, one day spend it on direction, do some form studies, and then take on intensity by choosing a light source, um, do the form studies by drawing simple sketches without worrying about lighting just yet, you know, choose different kind of polygon shapes like I've done with my form studies. And then material and color. I'm going to show you some of my form studies at the very end of this um, video so you can see the kinds of stuff that I've done with it. Um, and that's the kind of studies that I want you guys to take on. And uh, yeah, so take it all bit by bit. One day spend on intensity, start introducing some light sources onto these form studies. And then the material and then the color. Um, so when I say form studies, which I recommend for everyone, what I usually do is I just go to my lasso tool. Let me just get my brush. There's this brush here, a sculpting brush I really like. It's not like a sculpting brush, but it seems like I'm sculpting, like it gives a texture. It's a really nice brush. Um, okay, so I just go to my polygon lasso and choose a random shape. Hide it, control H. Hide the marching ants. And I choose my base tone. My base tone has to be a decent, um, like a, you know, a good mid, mid tone depend, depending on the intensity of the light. So let me choose an intensity. This is how bright it'll go. Let me make it a bit brighter. Remember, when an object is reflective, even if it's a reflective surface, it's not going to reflect 100% of the light source. Never, because it isn't a light source. A mech, if you're thinking about the shoulder blade of our shoulder pad of a mech, let's say you're painting Megatron or something, and there's the sun behind him, and you have the mech, and then you have the shape of the mech and all of that stuff, and you want to learn how to paint it. 
you want to approach it and you want to you're going to get the light source color aren't you you in your mind are choosing the same color for the light source as you are for the light tone of the matter that is the shoulder shoulder pad no the light source is its own independent brightest thing in the painting nothing is, should be brighter than the sun in your painting or as bright period period that's it everything is a step down everything is a reflection everything is a diluted light vector light ray bouncing back as long as it has to bounce back a certain percentage of its intensity has been decreased so no you aren't choosing the light source and the light tone of the color you're no don't confuse them as the same thing you should have a mid-tone dark tone and light tone for the object separate from the light source and the lightest tone of the object that you're choosing should not be as bright as the light source. So this is the brightest area here, but that's not how bright. I'm not going to use that brightness um, in here. No way, because I've lost all the form already. What the heck is this? Is this another light source? No, it isn't. And I'm losing form. Too much light, remember, whitewashes your, your form out. So now I'm just going to decrease the opacity to something I can control very easily. And... I'm just going to start thinking about the form in my mind. Usually you guys should sketch this. I skip the sketch stage, ske sketch stage because I think of it in my head. I'll try to visualize it in my head. So let me think of all the areas that I think should be the brightest. So this surface area, thinking arrows, this, the arrow coming out of this, is pointing directly at this. So this should be the brightest area. All right, so I've chosen my brightest area. My darkest area is going to be, I'm going to choose something of a dark tone, is going to be this area here. Okay. This is going to be, I'm going to turn up the opacity. This is the side that is the darkest. So I've chosen this, I've chosen the shape of the object. And I'm reshaping it. Of course, I'm not going to choose the perfect shape right away uh, with the polygon tool. I have to reshape some more. Okay, and now I chose the darkest tone. And this is pretty much what I go through when I paint these. Um, this area here, you might want to, we might think it's bright, and you might think this area here is bright, but it's not. Everything is a step down from the area that is facing it directly. If this is facing this way, and this is facing this way, they're going to be less intense than the one that's facing that way. That way you build yourself a map of reference in your, in your drawing way before you even start rendering. Because you've chosen your light source, and you've, you're, you've chosen your light source, you've chosen the lightest surface area, of the object. Therefore, after you've chosen that light source, everything is just easy to figure out because you can't go lighter than that, so everything is a step down. So this is a pretty wonky version. This one also faces it directly, so we know because it's almost the same angle. And this is like almost it's the same exact tone as that. Not exactly. I'm going to darken this side up a bit. Decrease that intensity. I'm not yet ready to go that light. And depending on the kind of object, if it's a rock, if it's some sort of matte surface, I usually like to stick to matte surfaces. And this is a pretty crappy version <laughs> of what it is that I do. I'll show you what um, what those look like. I'm sure you've seen them on my DeviantArt already. But that's pretty much the process that I go through. Um nothing too too extreme nothing too difficult it's just about thinking about all of those components that i talked to you about today about <laughs> say about one more time this <clears throat> okay just reshaping it i haven't done these in a while That's pretty much it. I can just mess around or, you know, do anything I want with these. Um, as long as I know where my light source is and where my... 
where my object is, the, the surface area and the direction. So all of this has to do with direction, which areas are facing it, which areas aren't. And I just keep rendering until I'm done. And that's it. Um, rendering, just ad adjusting the tones, adjusting the percentage, the intensity, adjusting the exposure, exposure, at adjusting um, like uh, the, the color, if I do decide to go to color, thinking about what kind of color it would have, if there's bumps and blemishes on the surface, all of that stuff I adjust later on. As long as you have your light source and you have your highest point, you're thinking about the direction, you're thinking about all of those components, you're safe. I usually sometimes add these like cracks on the edges, which are really fun to paint. Just thinking about the form, how form acts. And I call them form studies because it m forces me to imagine the three dimensional, like the actual 3D model <clears throat> of what it is that I'm drawing. It's really fun. It can be a little bit painful in the start. Trust me, your brain can start itching. But um, after you're done with that initial stage of shock, <laughs> you're like, what the fuck? Why am I trying to imagine something so complicated? After that is over, it'll just be commonplace. Um, and it'll, be, it'll come to you naturally. Just trust me on it. You can do it. Okay. That's pretty much how I do these form studies, and then I go in and get make another shape and choose the base tone again and think about where the light is and the dark spots, so the darkest areas, which could be here. I don't usually choose this much of a contrast, though. The contrast is usually less. And there's something of a gradual tone here because there seems to be like a a bend in the surface here. Maybe there's a bump up here that catches some of the light. I'll have to add to it later, meaning I have to get out of the select tool and push up that bump. That's catching some of that light and of course the cast shadows. So if you're painting one object in front of another object, there needs to be a cast shadow. So if this object here is in front of this object here, then some of this shadow will be all up in this grill. What the fuck did I just say? All up in its grill. Not krill. That's a kind of fish, right? <laughs> Okay, so follow the form. When you cast a shadow of an object on another object, you have to follow the rules of that object. You're up in its house, yo. You have to follow its rules. <laughs> its rules say, go this way, you better go that way. Or else you're in trouble because you lose the form. So this bump here, this this line that I just did of shadow, I didn't just um, cast the shadow just like that. and Okay, I'm done. <laughs> No, you have to <laughs> cast the shadow with a line like that, according to the form and how it's moving up and down. <laughs> okay, so this whole area is a response to this, so direction with this as well, and the cast shadows with that. Okay, all right, so that shadow is cast, and then you can just keep sculpting and get a good textured brush going on with y'all. And if you don't know how intense this gradual tone is, just think about the directions. Again, which arrows are pointing where? So these arrows are pointing to each other. They're parallel, therefore equals highest point. Then this area is pointing here. This area is pointing this way. There's an angle here. They are not parallel. Not parallel in this area. Therefore, this area should be less intense than this area. So this area should be brighter, parallel. This area should be less bright, not parallel. This area is like, whoop, see you later. And the light is like, oh no, come back. There's a massive angle here. Therefore, this is the darkest area. And therefore, this is the lightest area. They are not parallel. Okay, and this is the angle of light intensity. This is the angle of direction right here that we're talking about. The last angle of the darkest point and the highest angle of the, of the lightest point in comparison to the light source as the checkpoint. And then we have... That angle, that angle, you don't have to actually measure it, it's just a symbolic angle. Um, 
So that's that's the intensity range in this surface area. Now then you have to think about this surface area here. This area is facing a completely different direction. It's a complete 180 maybe. It's an obtuse angle. It's completely moving away. This area, the reason why it's the darkest, it's because it's facing the complete opposite direction of the light. It's facing us like, see you later light, you and me cannot cannot be friends. And so what we have is a 180 degree. And that's why when they say they did a complete 180 because they looked away from the person. Like if you see an late old lady fall on the street and you do a complete 180, you completely ignore the lady because the lady's there on the street dying. Eh, and then you've just done a 180. You've looked away from her, she's here, and there's the 180 degree angle. Right? Yeah, 9 plus 9 is 18. Okay, <laughs> just in case I'm like messing around with these numbers. So that's it. That's what I mean by intensity. That's what I mean by not color. Well, I am painting grayscale. Color comes later. Um, but it is, it is, an, it is a, a factor of light sourcing. Um, that's what I mean by material. So the reflective nature of an object, if it's super reflective versus super not reflective. Um, and, uh, and the material, I mean the direction, which I just showed you, the direction of the angles. And and finally, the intensity of the light. If this light is super bright, then this area is going to be super bright. Not as super bright as this light. No, it's a little bit less super, but it is going to be light, the lightest point. Okay, and you just keep on going with those, and you have a lot of form. And the reason why these super duper form studies are so awesome is because if you do these, I mean, nobody can mess with you. You're building your your stats. You're you're just you're you're ready to go. If someone says, "Okay, I'm going to pay ten thousand dollars, paint me a really cool high tech Apple gadget thing," um, you'll be able to do it because in your mind you've already figured out the shape, figured out the direction, intensity, the color. You can put all those together and then, like a scientific formula, put it together and reproduce the three D object onto a two D surface. And that's at the end of the day what we're doing. This is a two-dimensional object uh, that we're painting on this canvas, and we're using three-dimensional rules of reality. Where you're sitting right now on your table, this is 3D land. Right here, and when you're immersed and you're lost and you're zoned out into your painting, this is 2D land, which is why the why art is so hard because it's the complete unnatural, the most unnatural thing to do is think like a 2D-dimensional object or like bring in three-dimensional objects or create three-dimensional rules or apply three-dimensional rules onto a two-dimensional object. That's crazy, but we can do it because we're artists and we're awesome. Okay, so that's it. That's all I have to say for today. Um, don't forget these awesome rules. There's messy, messy <laughs> um, things that I showed you. Um, there's a lot that goes into it. Uh, contrast, highlighting tones, um, or lack of highlighting tones for intensive, reflective, intensely reflective material. The intensity is the direction of the object as it faces the high object, and whether or not the, the high the light source, sorry, and whether or not the vectors of the light source wrap around or arrows. Um, there's color and color intensity. Um, the color intensity means high exposure to light. More light means more saturation. And um, just don't forget these units. These units are very important. If you study them, you keep yourself thinking about them. Then your use of light source and your your thinking of light lighting will change, and therefore all of your drawings will improve. I freaking promise you that, because everything you're drawing is following these rules. And if you don't follow these rules, what are you drawing? You're just drawing something that doesn't look realistic, that isn't that cool to look at. And that's what people want. When someone likes something and says, wow, this drawing is so good, what they're saying, and they don't know how to say it, is the direction is check, intensity is check, material is check, color is check. That's what they're saying. But they don't want to say that because everyone's getting lazier nowadays. So they're just going to say it's good. You want people to say it's good and you want to know why you're doing it right. You don't want to accidentally paint a nice picture. Think of these rules. Use them in your drawing and you will improve. I promise you that. So um, don't forget to like and subscribe. Yes, I said it. <laughs> um, I really appreciate all of your support. If you have any questions for the Q&A sessions, please ask me. Um, there won't be a Q&A session this time because not enough questions came in, so I'm going to save them all to accumulate for the next video. So um, have a great day and bye-bye.